a microscope makes you see things really close so you can get, get a better look at things that are very small. It's sort of like a binoculars to see things that sees things close up. It shows people that like there's more to there's more things to life, like little things that we can't see, but they're always there. Welcome to Microworlds, a world that exists all around us, but one that we can't even see without the help of microscopes. Oh, you can really see the detail on this. Through this series of videos, you'll learn about different kinds of microscopes and meet marine biologists at NOAA who use them as part of their daily work. These scientists need to see into this minute world to answer questions like, how old is this fish? Why do fish get sick? And what do seals eat? As a past Microworld student once thought, I would think it would just show like, just a bunch of lines squirming around. But when I actually saw it, when I saw what the cells looked like, like, wow, microscopes can actually do that. Carla Stare experiences personal discoveries like this every day by peering into a minute world that's invisible even to most microscopes. In this course, you've been exposed to light microscopes, but at NOAA's Northwest Fishery Science Center, Carla uses a bigger and more powerful scanning electron microscope, which allows her to examine marine organisms all the way down to the cellular level. But what makes it so much stronger than a light microscope? It's different in a couple ways. One is that it uses electrons instead of light, so you can see much smaller surfaces and, and textures than you can with a light microscope. And the other way is instead of shining light through, you're looking at the surface, very much like how you would use a dissecting microscope. Okay, cool. But in your work, why does it help you to see the surface of a cell? I work with a large group of people that looks at effects of contaminants on fish. What I do with the microscopes is I look at cells of the fish to see if they have been damaged. For instance, I've looked at the nose of the fish, especially in fish that we know have been exposed to contaminants. Wait a second. Did you say a fish has a nose? What does it look like? Maybe it's flat. I don't know. <laughs> probably has a lot of scales on it and really cool designs. A fish has a really cool nose. It actually has two little teeny holes in it. One the water goes into and the other one the water comes back out of. And inside it has a really cool design. There's all these special sensory cells that fold it up into a structure called a rosette. Um, that's really small and you can't see the sensory cells without a scanning electron microscope. Very cool. But why does a fish even need a nose? Sometimes you can see fish going up to the surface for air, and they kind of bite a bubble. Maybe their nose would take in that air. Fish cannot use their nose to breathe. They only use it for smell. They use their gills to absorb oxygen from the water, but there's no connection between the nose and the gills. Are they going to smell something in the water or something? Well, I don't know if they can smell underwater. Maybe they can smell if something's coming. They probably need that to smell their predators or prey. Yeah, fish can use their nose to smell their food, their prey, and to escape predators. It's really important for salmon to have a sense of smell. All stages of the salmon need their sense of smell, starting from when they're, they're born in freshwater streams. They need to find their way out to the ocean. They need to be able to avoid predators. When they get out there, they need to be able to find food. They use smell to do all of that. And then when it comes time for the salmon to return home again to um, spawn, they need to find their home stream again. Wow, it sounds like a fish depends on its sense of smell even more than we do. So in order to look at how contaminants affect fish, how do you examine its nose? And what do you look for? To prepare a specimen for the scanning electron microscope, first you have to put it in a chemical fixative like formalin or glutaraldehyde. And that keeps the tissues from degrading any further. And because the electron microscope, uh, the way it works is that it uses a beam of electrons, the whole column back here is under vacuum. So whatever you put in inside the microscope can't have any water in it. If you have something with water in it, it's gonna explode. 
we do that by taking the fixed sample and removing all the water and replacing it with alcohol. And then we go through a process called critical point drying. We flood the tissue with liquid carbon dioxide and then increase the pressure so it becomes a gas and then slowly release that so it leaves a dried piece of tissue. If you just air dried the tissue, it would shrivel up and it wouldn't look right. Then it has to be coated with a conductive surface for the electrons to interact with it. So the purple is the metal molecules that have been heated up on that metal plug on the top surface. And because it's under vacuum, they just float around in space and basically coat everything that's in there. Then you can put it in the microscope. And that takes about two days worth just to do that processing. Whoa, that's a lot of processing. So can we see that baby halibut's nose again? And what are we looking at now? So what we can see here is we go up the magnification. This is 350 times. There's one of the nostrils that's forming for the nose. And then there's these specialized sensory cells here called neuromass. There's a number of these on all fish that have these long finger-like things called cilia that can sense chemicals and they sense movement in the water. And if uh, that nose has been damaged, then the cilia will be gone. To see the detail in neuromass, Carla has the microscope zoomed into 3,700 times magnification. You see this line? On this image, that's five microns, which is way smaller than the width of just one hair on your head. On other fish smelling cells, Carla sees this same reduction of the sensory cilia. So how does this happen? Where do the pollutants that cause this come from? Chemical contaminants come from many human activities. If we are not careful with through oil spills or runoff from streets, agricultural and industrial, of course, um, are sources of contaminants. But the hardest one to work with and understand is the smaller amounts that everybody does all the time. If you wash your car and the oils that are on your car is washed down the drain, or using too much pesticides on your grass. Plastics can leach out from plastic containers, wrappers on candy bars and things like that. Another source is people taking medicine or if they're flushing old medicine down the toilet, it can end up out in the waters. Uh, and also uh, flame retardants. We've recently learned that those are chemicals that don't break down very readily. Surprisingly, Many of the contaminants that make it into our waterways come not from big industries, but from us. And if our waste is not disposed of properly, it may not only impact the beauty of our rivers, lakes, and ocean, but also artificially distress the survival of fish and other animals in their natural environment. They are also bound to have many more effects that have not even been considered yet. So researchers like Carla continue to examine the tiniest details of animals to see how they're faring in the modern world. But the more she finds answers, the more questions come up. Questions that you may be able to someday answer by peering into micro-worlds. Pine cones? That's what it looks like. Why was a fish that were there? I guess that's my fascination with, with biology and the field of science is just learning how do in, organisms interact with each other? Why are they the way they are? What value is it to have this uh, beautiful hexagonal pattern on the surface of a fish egg? You know, why is it there? It's just, those are the kinds of things that fascinate me and that scanning electron microscope gives me an opportunity to see a lot of those little things that you would not be able to see any other way.